Hey everybody, welcome back to the Podcast Daily. It is Freaky Friday, and it is also a mashup with our spring preview, looking at all the positions. Why are we doing it that way? Who knows? It just makes the most sense for us today because we have uh, an interview with James Laurinaitis, who is returning to his alma mater, the uh, College Football Hall of Famer and Ohio State uh, linebacking legend. Uh, is going to be a graduate assistant working with Jim Knowles uh, in the Ohio State defense. So without further ado, let's just dive right into that. That's what you're here for. We've got James Laurinaitis. And then after that, if you want to stick around, Bill Landis and Jeremy Birmingham are going to talk with me, Austin Ward, about Ohio State linebackers. All right, hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast. We are in the Woody Hayes Athletic Center, and so is James Laurinaitis, the College Football Hall of Famer, former Ohio State All-American, has returned. My wife asked me this, James, how can you be a graduate assistant? You're like, <laughs> you've been gone for like 15 years. Yeah. So uh, I guess they, you know, they made that rule where if you play in the NFL, you have up to seven years to go be a GA. So I was in it. I didn't even know that rule existed. I, I walked in um, to Notre Dame with Marcus and just, I was like, I don't know if it needs to be an analyst or this. And, you know, when he said GA then. I was like, hold on a second. That involves class. That involves, but, <laughs> you know, but it involves you being able to be on the field. And so it's a blessing to be able to be on the field and actually work with the players. Okay. So you had to, you got some classes going awesome. here? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll, have to, I'll have to sign up for class. I don't have to do it yet. I have to <laughs> go through all those things, you know, this week and next week to figure it out. But we'll see uh, what all that entails. Okay. Well, I think everybody asked you about the football side. We forgot about the academics <laughs> no doubt. of coming back here. No doubt. Um, we know the, this is where you, your heart is. This is your alma mater, but also one of your best friends gave you that opportunity a year ago. So before we talk about returning to Ohio State, like, how did Marcus take the news uh, that you you weren't going to be there anymore? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I think Marcus, he understood. Uh, you know, he understands that my family and I wanted to be back here at alma mater and, and at Ohio State. Um, and so he, the nice thing about when you're, when you're, really good friends with somebody, you know that nothing business-wise is going to come between that. And so I was just thankful, obviously, for him to trust me in, in coming up there and putting the work in and, and really giving me some freedom to, to run that linebacker room. And so just grateful that he understood. Um, it was something that I stressed about a lot, you know, making that call. But uh, the way he handled it um, made it go a lot smoother for me. I know that a big part of the Previous conversations before you joined with Marcus in Notre Dame last year was if you had talked with Ryan Day or been around in the Woody, do you really want to do this? Is it going to connect? Like It's not something that you have to do for the next mm -hmm. step in your career, and you were already doing things here, uh, BTN and the fan that were successful. But once you made the decision to try it, did you know right away that you were going to keep doing it, or was there a moment you're like, all right, yeah, I am on board with this plan? Um, early on, man, in spring ball, you know, you're learning everything. You're learning how you're trying to teach things. You know, it was overwhelming. Yeah. And you're like, okay, I got to. But it's it, you had to sit back. And my wife used to say to me, it's because it's all new. Like, this side of it is all new to you. <laughs> so, like, just give yourself a chance to get through those busy months and then breathe. And uh, once I was able to do that, the fall was great. Um, so, early on, as, like, anyone that takes a new job, although I know football there's little, there's a lot that goes into coaching. Um, I had talked to Ryan before, um, and he had, you know, said to me, "Are you sure you're crazy enough to do this profession?" <laughs> and, and but what I've learned now from being on a staff is that there's so many pieces. Like everyone thinks that you can just jump into a staff and just say, you know, hey, make a visit. Like there's so much that goes into a football right. staff, and there's athletic departments, and there's the, so the, for whatever reason, timing never meshed up. Um, and I'm just thankful that, you know, I took the chance by going to South Bend and joining Marcus and that he gave me the opportunity. And now I'm thankful that, you know, Ryan was, um, you know, excited about the opportunity to bring me back. And so I'm thankful to him for giving me the opportunity and, and the timing was just right. So it's hard to, you know, haven't been in staff meetings and all that now, you know, and looking <laughs> back, you're like, there are a lot of really good football coaches in college football and pro football right and so you know i think sometimes people think oh you just rip somebody out of the role and then it's well we get that a lot james right like ohio state fans and because of the success of this program is so well 
there needs to be a role for Eddie George. Mike Doss needs to mm -hmm. coach safeties. Like, let's get one of the – Malcolm Jenkins needs to come back coaching mm -hmm. corners. It's it's not that easy, A, because of the time commitment and because yeah. it's – not everybody is able to make the same transition from on-field success to actually coaching mm -hmm. it. So, f I guess for you specifically, what what makes you think now that that, that you are one of those people? Well, I, to be honest, Austin, when, when I played, I had to be an X's and O's guy. I, I could never be somebody who just showed up and just tried the ball out. I didn't have that skill. Yeah. And so I was a talented player. I was cer certainly athletic for our time. Um, but I also think that it's a game where you have to intellectually be a step ahead. And I had to be that way. And so my whole thing is now with the kids who are super athletic, um, and kids who are so talented to be able to say, gosh, like, all right, <laughs> you could play so much faster if you knew exactly what your role is on this play, exactly where you can get burned on this play. And, you know, heck, if you're a man coverage, well, I, it's not as easy as, oh, I got that guy. Well, your ideas of how you cover that guy, depending on receiver splits, pick situations, all of those things, um, all come into play. And if you're just going out there thinking, I'm going to just line up wherever, <laughs> you're not going to play as fast or up to your potential. Yeah. And so I had to always try to get that edge as a player. And now I try to help the players realize that edge without overdoing it, because you can overdo it too, to help them just play faster. Because if our if the guys that we have here play fast, um, then you have some of the best in America. Okay. I know you have a million things to do to get rolling. This is day three on the job, so I can't keep you much longer. Quinn is over there ready to take you off to do the next thing. So just first of all, welcome home. Second of all, how good does it hear to you know how sound to hear that you are home here? It feels really good, and it'll, it'll be complete when my family gets here. Um, I mean, my wife is really excited to be back. She's got our daughters already enrolled in schools, so <laughs> she's uh, – my phone constantly gets hit up with, you know, places to peek at and all that stuff. So <laughs> we're just excited to, to be back, and you have so many friends, obviously, here and people that, that care about you in, in a place that we love, so – it feels really good to be home. All right. Well, there was a really nice farm being built out here. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if it's still available. It's, gone. <laughs> it's sold. All right. Well, you can always try again. But James Laurinaitis is, is back. He is a graduate assistant. He's enrolling himself in classes just like the kids. Uh, the daughter's getting rolling. Uh, it's great to talk to him again and have him back wearing the scarlet and gray. So thanks for your time, awesome. James. Good to yeah. see you again. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for joining us on the podcast. All right. Thanks again to James Laurinaitis for giving us some time as uh, we wrapped up that whole Ohio State Coaching Staff Media Day on Wednesday uh, and got a couple minutes of his time and a little bit more insight on a position group that might be the most stable of any on the roster. Is that a fair way to look at it, Bill? Yeah, I think so. Um, to the point where like Jim Knowles was not asked about anybody other than the two guys who were returning uh, and Tommy Eichenberg uh, and Steel Chambers when we spoke to him on Wednesday, which was kind of a bummer. Uh Probably uh, a little bit of, uh, of of the beat at large dropping the ball, myself included, because I was there for a few minutes and didn't ask about any of the individual linebackers. Uh, but we did get to learn about Tommy and Steele, who will play the majority of the snaps this year. Yeah, yeah I, I don't think know if it's the most stable group. I think it's like, you know who the starters are. But other than that, I think it's the group with more unanswered questions than any other group on the team, pretty much. Because you don't. Oh don't, come on! We no, don't know. Not. We don't know anything. <laughs> we don't know anything about the guys behind Tommy Steele and Cody. We know nothing about them. The offensive line needs three new starters. Yeah, that sounds like much I mean, more we, we, predictable. We, have, we got eighteen guys to choose from there. I, I mean, I, I just think I, I just don't. Burn I'm not this. Say we're, it's, we're already I'm not eight say minutes into stable. this episode. You're, you can't hook people in with that nonsense. I'm not going to say it's the most stable group. I think that it's a group that you really look at it, and if if things go how we expect they will after spring, I mean, you could have what six total guys at this position. It, it's it's sort of weird. Well, they only played two primarily. I know, but that's my point. What happens next? Every every Ohio State every guy that Ohio State fans in the last couple of, like decades have been waiting for that big return year comes back somehow gets hurt and misses for some reason. Oh. Uh, you know, you don't know. What I'm saying is that it's <laughs> oh, we <boy>. live <laughs> we live in a world where the the unknown is freaking terrifying. Man, you know what I mean? Are you, are you drunk? <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> You're speaking an injury into existence. I'm just on saying February 3rd. I'm just saying there are two guys 
that we know are going to start. There's Cody Simon, who you know is going to come in after them. And then that's it. That's all we know. So Do we? I think it is. I think it's weird that nobody really asked questions about the other guys. I mean, one, I, I James Laurinaitis was asked about CJ Hicks. He's the guy everyone wants to talk about because he's the five star and all that stuff. But he's still a guy who's only in his second year in the program after coming out of uh, Archbishop uh, Alter in, in in Kettering. It's not like uh, a like to like jump to make to get to college. So people shouldn't have expected him to be the guy ready to fill in last year. But now you're going to need some some dudes to step up. Where does Court Williams fit into this whole mess? Is he a guy that moves down to linebacker now? Is Sonny Styles if the safety room's too busy? Like there's all these moving parts, and I don't think we really know what their plan is. That's all I'm saying. Don't get weird. Don't get weird. <laughs> you, you made it weird. <laughs> we were just sitting, sitting here. <laughs> Bill and I were kind of concerned. Like this might be the most boring out of all the position previews because you've got a second team All American coming back. Uh, somebody else who could have been a third or fourth round draft pick potentially. They're both starters. They played a combined like fourteen hundred snaps last year, and, exactly. and Co- Cody Simon was third. It was exactly. like two hundred and thirty something. <laughs> all you guys are doing is making my point for me. That's why this it's hard to say it's stable. You have a, a Oh, they're all ha- back. You have starters. Bro, this is this is the twenty twenty three linebacker preview, not twenty twenty four. You have star oh. <laughs> oh, that makes so much more sense. Cool. Let's just go from the top. <laughs> no, but no <laughs> I'm serious. You if if the, the point is heading into spring, we know Tommy Eichenberg's not gonna play in this in spring ball. You you expect CJ Hicks, as we talked about on the Thursday Stonk Watch, to get some some reps and some run to see where that goes. But behind that, you've got Gabe Powers, you've got Reed Carrico, you've got, you know, is Mitchell Melton a linebacker? There's a lot of questions that we just don't know what these guys are or where they fit in. I mean, we, we haven't seen anything out of Carrico except for on special teams. We didn't see any of Gabe Powers at all last year. Like, you don't know what's after those guys. And that's a little concerning because you just don't know what's after and we've seen too many weird things at Ohio State to be like well who cares who's behind those guys because we, we always find yeah. weird weirdness I'm not sure what injury would actually keep Tommy Eichenberg off the field if there was a game on Saturday however now well, you never know if he gets in, in, entrenched in some sort of battle with a raccoon at, on, at their property <laughs> those things are vicious yeah, yeah. Rabbit. shark attack maybe well yeah that's yeah. true so well then what do you think burn like you know that Tommy Eichenberg is going to leave some reps in spring ball. Think that that's where C.J. Hicks gets his most uh, experience or snaps or practice reps or whatever uh, to grow and develop. Maybe that could be a spot for uh, Carrico to jump in there and get in the mix. I don't know. Like, What do you think is going to happen? What would you like to see happen for Ohio State? Uh, what I, I think you have to see C.J. Hicks be the second guy in the middle at this point. Even though his size and speed combination lends him to potentially being the Jack slash Leo also. So, I mean, there's a lot of weird – without Mitchell Melton being available in the spring, that opens the door even more for CJ to get more of those reps at Jack or Leo, in my opinion, than they would otherwise. So, like, does he get put into that spot almost by default and then you let Carrico or someone else fill in the middle? I mean, or Cody – does Cody play the middle? I mean, these are – there's there's weird – there's questions here. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. <clears throat> There's a there's like a funny a funny thing happening with the Jack Leo position, which I suppose we should talk about in conjunction with the linebackers, because Larry Johnson like didn't say this directly, but like sort of said like I don't think that guy should come out of my room. And then Jack's uh, Jim Knowles, excuse me, was asked like, can the Jack be a linebacker? And Jim Knowles is like, I don't really see that happening. So like <laughs> I don't know, I don't know who's gonna play. The, the guy that that Jim Knowles did mention specific, specifically was Mitchell Melton and how much he liked him last year and how hopeful he is that that he can do that role again this year. He did not say CJ Hicks, which I was also kind of hoping for Burn, because I, I can kind of see that vision as well, but uh, it doesn't sound like that Jim Knowles has the same thoughts dancing in his head. Well, I mean, who knows better about Jim Knowles, the defense Jim Knowles or me. Yeah. I think you and I both, both know more about personnel than, than he does. Yeah. I think we all cast votes for CJ Hicks to get at least considered for that role, given his athleticism. But um, it is strange that, disconnect about that position like i don't know if we should have included the jack or leo in which conversation for the linebackers of the defensive line uh clearly that larry johnson and jim Knowles don't even see fully eye to eye on that at this point heading into spring so um well i guess we'll have to save that for later on um but it is it is a strange thing to monitor because that and 
some of the rotational stuff that's happened for Ohio State. There, it's weird that that would come up in a a low pressure February press conference where you have two coaches, an assistant coach and the defensive coordinator, disagreeing on what the next step should be for a couple key parts of running a defense. Yeah, but I mean, you look at yeah. Larry's defensive line group. He needs bodies over there, so you 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 can understand the the insistence on saying, hey, let's put Jack Sawyer just defensive end and let him play defensive end. That is how he was recruited, that he is six foot five, 275 pounds. It's not what, if you look at the Jim Knowles defense at Oklahoma State or otherwise, that's not what has traditionally lined up at the Jack. You're talking normally guys who are 6'2", 6'3", 240. It's not the same body type. And I don't think that Sawyer's production at Jack last year um, would indicate that he absolutely nailed the position. So I, I, I think there's realistic reasons to have that conversation. All right. Well, let's assume yeah. that they're not. So how how will this uh, linebacker group transpire beyond the top two, where we know that they're going to still get, uh, as long as they're healthy, 99% of the snaps? It's going to be a lot. I, I do think uh, the, the thing I wanted to ask Jim Knowles, I didn't get the opportunity to and wish I would have, was if he sees himself at all deviating from his lack of rotation at the position because of a guy like CJ Hicks. Like I don't I don't think Cody Simon's the guy who who would force his hand that way. I think I think Cody will have a similar role to what he had last year. Um I at the moment have a hard time like envisioning Reed Carrico or, or anyone else kind of entering that conversation other than CJ Hicks. Um uh, Reed Carrico was sort of talked about more like a, a Sam when they went to a three linebacker look. Um, and then when they did do that, it was more Cody Simon who came on the field. So, like, as long as Cody Simon is in front of Reed Carrico, I feel like Reed is probably blocked a little bit. Um, and then Gabe Powers, like, I, I don't know. I still think Gabe Powers is going to eventually be a defensive end. So I, I don't know uh, how he kind of fits into that picture as well, which is also, like, he's a second-year guy. I think that's that's fine if he grows into that. Um, but to me, it really boils down to it being sort of a four-man show with Tommy and Steele leading the way. And then what does CJ do? And then is Cody's role any different than it was last year? Yeah, we saw CJ. Or I'm sorry, we saw Gabe on Wednesday at, inside of the the team room, the the player, you know, uh, hangout, and he did not look like he had put on the weight that I thought he was going to when he came to Ohio State. He's still probably about 225, 230 pounds, so he seems to be intentionally staying lighter to play linebacker. So that was a, a bit of a surprise to me. But it does also then add the question: This is a, a high four star recruit from you know from Columbus, essentially heading into year two did not play at all last year that, that i can recall i don't think he had any snaps let alone you know get to the four game threshold or close to that so uh, there clearly was a developmental year necessary but this spring is huge for for a guy like Gabe powers yeah and then there's also the, i mean it's it's amusing to talk about this linebacker position where it can be you know turned into a safety spot it can be turned into a jack and leo because the other part of this discussion is how does sonny styles fit into it we saw him playing in like a little bit larger package first in the first month of the season against Wisconsin and then certainly against Georgia in the Peach Bowl as well. So he enters into that conversation. They're not going to, I don't think, view him as an extra linebacker or move him out of a safety room anytime soon. But if there are snaps, Bill, to your point, that go somewhere else, that's somebody who could take them that may not be already in that meeting room with Jim Knowles or James Laurinaitis. Yeah, he would be the one. Um, I I'm very curious what they do with him. And and Jim Knowles was talking about Sonny on Wednesday is like a guy that I th I think he sort of uses someone he can like deploy situationally. But I also think there's a scenario where like Sonny's a starting safety unless you need him for this specific guy you're going against. And like against Georgia, that was Darnell Washington. There aren't a whole lot of Darnell Washingtons walking around this planet, but sure. there are probably uh, individual matchups uh, like big athletes of which Sonny is that they, maybe they feel like they can kind of just match him up one-on-one -on -one, you go where he goes kind of deal and then play somebody else at safety and then that kind of changes the dynamic of the defense a little bit so I think he's like a Swiss army knife I, I can't imagine maybe over time he can grow to be like 240 pounds and then you just sort of move him down and he's a linebacker all the time um, I think they probably prefer to keep that versatility in line with Sonny so I, I'm like not on alert for him to I don't know, look out there one day and then there's the, the four two five <laughs> base and one of the two is sunny. I don't, I don't think that's going to yeah. happen, but um, it's also Jim Knowles' defense. So like he can do whatever he wants. If he falls in love with Sonny Styles and he wants him to play linebacker, like he's going to do it. So <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't think that that'll happen, but it's not impossible. What if he tried to make him play defensive end? I, 
You think, think a 6'4", 220 pound freak athlete well, can play you, the? You Leo said position? when he gets you, you said when he gets to to two forty, you never know. Yeah. I just think it'd be funny. I mean, just to to hear the conversation between Knowles and Larry Johnson at that point would be funny. I guess, Larry, <laughs> I have an idea. We're not only going to take your guys to play Jack, but we're going to put in a safety at your defensive end. <laughs> like, um, that's I think that'd be funny. But uh, no, Sonny is too much of a unicorn to not put out there somewhere, and so. However, you have to deploy him, whether it's in the nickel safety, whether it's in the deep safety because he is so long and rangy, whether it's a linebacker because he's so big. I mean, he's going to have to be on the field. This is something Ohio State is going to have to try to adjust this year to adjust the personnel into the to, to who they're playing and who the who to not play in certain matchups. But Sonny's too versatile not to play. And at this point, you have to just put your best athletes on the field and let them do best athlete things, I think. How do you if, think if, you're, if you're taking, I'm sorry, if you're taking a bunch of risks on defense anyway, and that's sort of your calling card, I would put the guys out there who have the highest potential to do something uh, really great just as much as they do really bad. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> because at this juncture, you can play a game against Georgia and play 95% really good football, but the 5% of the plays lose you the game. I'd rather have guys out there in the 95% of the time that are game changers. That's just my my personal a feeling on that. Yeah. Well, I think, I think that's probably the right way to feel about it, but then that also makes me think, well, then if CJ Hicks should be on the field in some capacity, it be on, like, I'm not saying play CJ and bench Tommy, but CJ I'm saying to play. He's the Jack. He should. <laughs> yeah. Put him at the Jack. Cause the one, the one thing, that, yeah, like the thing that James Lauren had said about CJ was like, there are a lot of things that go into playing linebacker, but when you look at all the guys out there, the one that moves around differently is CJ. Which is yeah. like not an abs- like we're not surprised to hear that about the five star prospect, but like okay, then find a way for that guy to get on the field. I don't care how right. it has to happen, but he needs to play. And that was the impression James Laurinaitis had of him in one meeting and watching him run on Wednesday morning. It's not like he's had extensive opportunity. That it, it is that visible. That is why talent evaluation is at some point easy because you can just look at these guys and go, that one looks different. That guy moves different. That guy you know, has a different way he carries his, his weight. CJ is that guy. Um, so you do want to find some way, but you also have to then be willing to accept the the challenges that come with that and the, the mistakes that come with it. Mm-hmm. Well, that it, that is an age old debate for coaches because you, as we said all along, you have two proven veterans. Steel Chambers has now been doing this for two years. He's also a pretty rare athlete in terms of building and play both offense and defense and certainly played at a much higher level as that year went on and he looked like he got more comfortable and confident at linebacker and you saw Cody Simon's role sort of taper off a little bit as he took the next step and then you know for whatever Tommy Eichenberg may lack in terms of pure measurable athleticism which is still better than he tends to get credit for he's he's the best he was the best linebacker in the country in the opinion of at least two of us and I think all three of us maybe I won't speak for Bill he never actually said that the way that Berm and I both did, but uh, he is a second team all American and we'll come back with more name recognition than just about any tackler in the country. So, you know what, that's a super high floor already with proven veterans. I don't know. How does CJ Hicks elevate the ceiling? You can project that he would, but do you want to lower the floor by having an inexperienced guy out there who doesn't know the system quite as well? I think they're going to want to do that. I just, I don't know the right amount. And I don't know that they're going to figure that out necessarily in March or April either. I think that's right. That, that's why That's why I think the, the Jack position could be so good for him because that's a position where Jim Knowles just like tells that guy what to do. Don't, don't, <laughs> CJ doesn't have to. And I don't, I don't, I don't mean it to come up the wrong way because I think CJ is a really smart football player, but you, the, the savviness just comes with experience and he doesn't have much of it yet. But the design of that position is like, okay, if this happens, you do this. If this happens, you do that. And why why couldn't a sophomore with limited experience who has like off the charts athletic ability do that and do it to you know a much higher level, frankly, than it was done last year? I think I think he could. I don't I don't know why you wouldn't want to do it. I guess, especially given how uncomfortable Jack Sawyer, in my opinion, looked doing it last year. Just like it seemed like it could be beneficial to everybody. Yeah, yeah. it seems like it's a natural fit. I mean, again, Colin Oliver at Oklahoma State in 20, uh, 2021 had thirteen sacks at the Jack position as a true freshman. So it's not like he walked into that having a bunch of experience doing it either. If you put the guy in the right position and you have an athletic enough kid who can do things, then you're going to get some of the productivity and results you want. Now, again, I think the the fit here is that there's an obvious and glaring need at defensive end opposite JT to Maloa, and that's where Jack Sawyer probably is best. So it 
I don't see where there would be a, a an issue experimenting with that in the spring, especially because again, Mitchell Melton is out. So why not? And because then you get a, you get the added benefit of seeing Carrico and and Gabe Powers at linebacker in the spring, mm. because you don't really need to play Tommy or or Steele at all in the spring. So you get a, some added benefit in getting all these guys some reps. That's the way I see it. Oh. I can't believe that Jim Knowles didn't ask us for our feedback on Wednesday. Like, clearly, we've yeah, got a good plan. He We didn't drop the ball. He dropped the ball by not asking us what we thought about the yeah. individual players. What do you guys think about this personnel for my system? Now you've seen it for a year. <laughs> Help me out here. I'm arguing with the defensive line coach over here. We need a mediator, and that's what we're going <laughs> to the podcast for. So, hey, we're here to help, America. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's what we're here to talk about is, is how things best work, right? That's our job, man. And the funny thing is the best athlete maybe in the linebacker room isn't going to be there till June, and that's Arvell Reese from Glenville who uh, is going to be a guy that will play on special teams early for Ohio State. He'll do what CJ and, and Sonny Styles did last year on kick return, I'm sure, just because he's six foot three and a half and 240 pounds and runs a 4'5". So you're going to see a guy like that out there and go, oh, maybe there's – Maybe there's an opportunity to to find a spot for him, but with with the lack of of true of three linebacker sets, it sort of feels weird because some of these guys are just floating in the ether. Maybe Arvell Reese can play the jack. Let's just put everybody at the jack position. Eleven I mean, jacks. It's not a bad idea. Here, you Chaos. show up on the you show up on the first day of spring ball. <laughs> Eleven people are in line to go play the jack. <laughs> You're up. They, How can you do it? They spent so much time wondering if they could. They never stop to ask if they should. <laughs> you know? I do know. It's yeah. a great it's a great question for everybody to ponder over this weekend ahead. Uh, that's also a great place to end this week on the podcast daily. Uh, Freaky Friday. Thanks to James Laurinaitis again for joining us. Uh, this has been our covering the, the bases here with our linebacker position preview with spring ball now uh, a little over a month away for Ohio State. Uh, getting ready for all of that ahead. Hope you have a great weekend. For Bill Berm, I'm Austin. We will see you on Monday morning on the podcast daily.